Okay, so hello everyone and thank you for being here. I'm super excited to have you, uh, so many people from all over the world. Um, and we are here today to talk about mobility. If you uh, have joined this call uh, and are not in our Social Distance Training Tips Facebook group, you, I encourage you to join that because there you will see the original posts that we're talking about and plus a lot more context and some extra posts from Anna. Um, and then you'll get to be part of all the future challenges and activities that we have coming up. Um, so just so you know, uh, so some places in the world are starting to loosen their restrictions a bit. We're starting to go into maybe transition where maybe some folks will be playing soon, maybe some folks not so soon. Um, but I just want to let you know that the plans for the group, um, it's grown really rapidly, really quickly. Um, we've got almost 1,400 players now, so um, we will probably continue. I mean, I, I set up the group and I said, hey, this is short term. Um, it's free for anyone who needs it because we're kind of in a crisis situation. But we will likely continue the group in some form. Um, we definitely want to help people make the transition to playing. Um, and then we will probably have some um, activities and such beyond. So. Um, so yeah, if you have friends that would benefit from being in the group, feel free to invite them. All Ultimate players are welcome. Doesn't matter if they're brand new, if they've been playing for a long time. Um, I think the stuff we've been having is useful for everybody because we pull from um, different skills and all kinds of stuff. Okay, so I think the email must have worked as more people are showing up. Um, okay, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, Anna, how about, do you wanna, uh, Dr. Anna, I should say, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hey everybody, so I'm Anna. I have been playing Ultimate since I was in high school, so after 15 years I kind of stopped counting. I'm not really sure how long it's been. Um, I have lived in Michigan for most of my life and I've done some traveling. Most of my Ultimate playing has been in the States. Um, and I am a physical therapist. I'm an orthopedic clinical specialist and I work uh, primarily in sports medicine, um, and my, well, now he's not here, but my dog decided to join us for a minute. His name is Apollo. Um, he may, <laughs> may come back. He likes to be close to me. Um, so, and I see someone else is sharing a dog, which I really appreciate. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really excited to be here with all of you today um, to get to talk about kind of how our mobility affects us as ultimate players. Uh, I think the ultimate world is sort of like at this cool point where it's starting to embrace more like science and training and sports specific training. Um, and this is just one aspect of all that. Sweet. Okay. So yeah. Um, what, what I want to start off with today is just starting with, with a little bit of the basics as if people haven't seen any of this stuff we've been talking about, or even if they have, um, I think it's, some of the terms you use can be a bit confusing. So we're talking about mobility. So how, do, how does the concept of mobility, like first of all, what does mobility mean? And how does that differ from the concept of flexibility? I think that's a great place to start. Um, so when I look at mobility, I'm sort of looking at a much broader view of how uh, an athlete can move through a certain motion. Um, as opposed to flexibility is sort of a more narrow understanding of like how well a muscle lengthens. Flexibility also almost always refers to like a passive stretch, a passive lengthening, um, which doesn't happen very often in the kind of athletes that like ultimate type athletes, running, cutting athletes. So, you know, even when our muscles are lengthening, they're doing it in a like controlled way of like still being contracted, um, which is called eccentric motion. Um, so mobility is like a bigger catch-all, right? And we're looking at um, how does a joint move? How do the muscles move? Can they, this athlete, like can you get through the motion without pain, um, cleanly? So it's just like a much, much broader and much more functional kind of category. I think um, we get stuck on flexibility just because that's like a more commonly used term and people are more comfortable with it, um, but it's a little bit limited in scope. Great, excellent. So yeah, I mean, it, it's talking about mobility is a lot more functional. I think we, we talk about in the UAP strength and conditioning, functional strength training. I think mobility is just a more functional approach to, um, yeah, like how we think about 
flexibility how our body how our body moves so and and the limitations that it might have so so these five mobility screens we've done are um a bit getting at helping us know more about what mo um what limitations we might have uh, in our movement. Actually, before we get into that, if, if we've failed one of these mobility screens, um, what we're gonna get to like what we should do, but I also wanna set it up for like, how long should it take? Like, what's the rate of improvement? How much influence can we have on our mobility? Uh, if we do these like corrections that you've recommended, uh, you know, is this something we've got to do like forever for the rest of our lives five times a day or should we expect to see uh, changes overnight? Yeah, what's the, what's the time frame we're looking at here? That's an awesome question um, and a difficult question. Uh, it, everyone hates this answer. It is going to be a little bit individual for everyone. Um, let's say it depends on the reason right so like if you have a, a prior injury then maybe it's something you'll just have to keep doing uh kind of consistently but in general i find a lot of people once they they gain motion so if we think about something like most people can visualize like an ankle if it doesn't bend very well and then you gain the bending and then you're reinforcing that in your training, you're doing squats, you're doing lunges, you're throwing, you're already like doing the motion uh, on a consistent basis. So after you've improved it, you might not need um, like as frequent uh, stretching and mobilizations because your, your body should be able to like use that motion correctly and um, apply it and then you wouldn't lose it. And if you took, months off and you sat at a desk all day, like you might see it go away again. Um, so there, there's some, some differences there. Um, yeah, so that might be a challenge that people may be having. Uh, yeah, right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we might see some old uh, tightness is sort of cropping up as we're less active than we, than we have been in a while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that that's interesting. And I think it just shows like that mobility is, if we pass these mobility tests, if we can move properly, like that's what your body is supposed to be able to do. And so then those correct movement patterns hopefully should be reinforced by just like normal natural um, movement once we, once we achieve that. Is that about right? Yeah, that's, I find that's the case for most people. If, if it's not happening, then there's like a question mark of like, what's causing that? What's hmm. the other problem? So that usually there's something else going on then. Oh, that's kind of interesting because I, I do think, um, like for me personally, like I, I do always have issues with, uh, well, I talked about the thoracic spine thing. Uh, maybe, I don't know whether it's I'd never regained that mobility or got it, or it could be like, it can there sometimes be just like lifestyle uh, choices that continue to aggravate uh, immobility issues. Like um, I do sit at us quite a lot. Might that sort of cause certain habitual tightening of certain things? Yeah, it definitely could. Um, I think, you know, you're, if you're spending a lot of time not moving, that's definitely a factor. I really have this like side interest in figuring out the T-spine mechanics and ultimate players because of the way the forehand throw motion is so different. I, I'm i like convinced that there's a consistent uh, pattern of like side limitation, um, but I do not have the research to back that up. That's just a personal theory. Um, so one thing that like I recommend a lot is doing offhand throwing and not just like the way you would do it in a game with the same pivot foot, but actually lunging and loading the other side of the body and turning your trunk those other ways um, to sort of create that motion balance. I know it's a lot to ask when people are already trying to train like all these other things. So mm -hmm. it's not always a top priority, but even if it happens sometimes, I think that can be a benefit for us. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I wonder too, I think some of that uh, might also be nervous system training. Like <clears throat> we, we would at least understand how to do that same motion in the symmetrical pattern. So for those of you that are in the UAP, this is another reason um, if you haven't checked out the body weight phase to go look at it because we do have a lot in there that's um, one of our SAQ sessions is a is a throwing session. Um, and uh, but it doesn't you don't even need a frisbee. It is more about pivoting. It's more about um, kind of capturing a, a larger pivot or a lower release pivot if you want. Um, and uh, 
and yeah, we do we do do that on both sides, and then we do extra sets on the non-dominant side. So so yeah, I've started to incorporate some of that into my own um, training as well. Because I mean, so one of the things that you keep mentioning in the Facebook group is that your body is task driven. So even if we don't know like what exactly the issue is or what the problem is, if we know there's an asymmetry, okay, like if we can get our body to do the symmetrical movement on the other side, um, then perhaps that's that's another way of just getting at some overall functional symmetry. I don't know if that's that's just a random thing I just said. I don't know if you agree with that or not. <laughs> I think it can help. I mean, there's there's like just this huge range of causes of mobility issues. So I think what we've gotten into this week with this group is like the really easy, low hanging fruit that you can do at home on your own. The yeah, the neuromuscular control that stuff gets a little more complicated. But I think there's definitely a benefit of like doing that in the training the way that you're talking about it, um, because our our body like needs the input in order to um like not only keep mobility but keep the joints healthy and keep the muscles healthy and um, our bodies really thrive on on motion which is actually awesome um though it's harder now because we're all sitting at home a little more so. yeah. yeah i think that that's a good thing to keep in mind the bodies thrive on motion mm -hmm. in the end it's so easy for us to get forget that we are um animals and uh <laughs> I think just moving every day in some way, shape, or form, to me, I kind of phrase that as just being a good animal. Have I been an animal for the day? <laughs> at, least, at least once. At least That's awesome. Time. So, uh, okay. Well, let's um, get to some of the specifics. Um, all right. So, we had five mobility tests, and we're just going to briefly talk about them in order and then have time for questions. So, we started with a supine leg raise. Um, just... Uh, um let's see so yeah i think what i want to get at with these with these screens is just briefly chat about why why each particular screen might matter for ultimate and um and uh i don't want to get into too many demonstrations here but we can reference sort of the pictures and stuff that we've talked about in the facebook group and people can find that pretty easily i think so why does this test matter uh for frisbee what does it test etc so there's two things that I see the test being important for. Um, the the first one that I think like kind of becomes obvious to a lot of people is just that um, people struggle with hamstring strains frequently. That's a sort of common complaint of ultimate players, uh, and um, there is some understanding. Like if you if you think about it, I always think about rubber bands or pulley systems. Um, in the body, you can tell I'm into biomechanics. Um, so if you think about it being like short or too tense, it can be easier to snap than if you have good mobility in that muscle. Um, and I, when we're looking at the pictures of these screens, um, the player that I was working with, she's like very flexible. Uh, so you don't have to get your leg 90 degrees to pass. So it's where the foot lays um, like past the kneecap on the other leg, which is a little harder to, to see. Um, but if you can get someone to take a picture of you, you can kind of like draw a little line and that really helps. Um, but yeah, so so injury prevention is huge, the hamstrings. Um, and also if you've had a hamstring injury, regaining motion after it's healed can be really important. Um, the scar tissue, in the hamstring basically becomes like part of the muscle. It's very cool. Um, but you want to make sure there's enough mobility there so that's not like then pulling on other sections and causing more problems. Um, and the, the other thing this test uh, gets at a little bit is hip motion in the joint itself. Um, when you're thinking about your running gait and you're thinking about knee drive and getting that hip flexion, um, or the hip bending towards the body, um, this test will pick up a little bit of that. Um, you know, clinically, like I do like a zillion tests and this wouldn't necessarily be my first choice for hip flexion, but it is something that you're doing at home that's really easy and simple. Um, you can catch that being a problem just through that. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. And then do you have anything uh, that you want to say specifically about um, asymmetries when it comes to this test as well? 
think in general, like uh, as a as a practitioner, I'm suspicious of any gross asymmetries, right? If if the two sides are very different, um, I start to ask questions. <laughs> And I think you should start to ask questions. Why is this so different side to side? That being said, if they're very different, but both pass the functional mobility screen, it might be less concerning, at least mm -hmm. from a, an ultimate standpoint, because you should have enough motion um, to, to play. Um, commonly, if someone has had a history of hamstring strain or tear, like that leg might never be as flexible as the uninjured um, side, but that might not affect your overall function. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then actually, while we're on this topic of um, injury risk, um, you know, I just want to be really clear here. If, if you don't, if there's like some screens that you're not passing, it doesn't necessarily mean that when you go out and play Frisbee, you're going to get hurt. Um, but do you want to tell us, like, wh how, sh how should we be thinking about these mo mobility tests with regard to our actual injury risk? Yeah, it's, it's really, really difficult to pin, like, any one little thing into injury risk. And you'll notice if you're, um, like, a couple people said they work in phys ed or if you're in the sports world we really have shifted the language of injury prevention to injury reduction <laughs> because <laughs> it's really hard to claim that any one thing would stop you from getting injured. It, injuring is like a, it's a multifactorial issue. Um, how recovered are you? How tired are you? Did you eat? Is the turf bumpy? Uh, is it a contact injury? There's so many things. So um, that's a great sort of caveat to like, we, can definitely see some correlation between injury risk and um, mobility restrictions, but it's not like a direct cause and effect. Oh my gosh, my ankle is tight, so I shouldn't play anymore. Uh, it's just something you might want to be kind of aware of and working towards. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Great. So, um, so the second test we did was, um, the uh oh yeah the infamous uh seated thoracic spine mobility so you said this is one of the first things i check when i have an athlete with any issues with their neck shoulders low back or hips so um that's like the whole body <laughs> <laughs> except for the ankles yeah. so why is this test that so many of us did not pass <laughs> so so important so um I'm going to dig into some anatomy for a minute. If you're Sweet. not into it, just like hang tight uh, and uh, hold on. Um, but I think it'll be helpful to sort of visualize. So um, in your spine between, like we all know where the little bumps are, where each of the vertebrae are in our back. Um, each of those vertebrae has like wings. <laughs> Okay. And those wings lay on top of each other and make little joints, which are called facet joints or facet joints, depending on what your accent preferences are. Um, in the thoracic spine, these little wings sit on top of each other, very horizontal. So they're made to turn. I don't know if you can all see me. Right. Um, versus let's say in your lower spine, so the thoracic spine turns really well, in your lower spine they're actually oriented like this and they smash into each other during rotation, oh, which is okay. not really comfortable. Um, so it's sort of this, part of the reason why I always look at T-spine first is that, that is the part of your body that's supposed to do the rotation. It's built to do the rotation. And if it's not doing the rotation, something else is rotating that shouldn't be. And that can cause all sorts of different issues throughout the body like we kind of talked about. It seems like a, like I always hesitate to be like, this one thing could solve all your problems because that's an oversimplification. Um, but it is like the first thing I check in a lot of cases. So that um, leads, like if this isn't moving, the shoulder is an easy one to see, right? So instead of doing this with your throw, you might be doing this mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not going to make your shoulder very happy or or this um so getting that that just made me sore um 
So <laughs> getting that trunk moving first can often sort of like offload or, or help um, other areas move less. Uh, was that overly clinical? Is that helpful? Oh, that was great. I, th I think that really uh, helps too, just to, just to think about, you know, especially for folks that are not in like physical, um, you know, exercise sciences, like, you know, we think of the spine as like just like one thing. Um, I, th I think that that would what a normal person would think because when you look at a skeleton hanging in the science room like that's just looks like it's all the same right <laughs> but but uh, so I think just kind of delineating between like the lower spine and the upper spine is really interesting and then like um, is like where where does the lower spine on a person like where how, where how do you know where does our lower spine end and our thoracic spine begin so some of that is actually they they count by the shape of those joints I was talking about um, and the ones kind of like where they meet are like transitionary joints. They look kind of in between. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, the five on the bottom are considered your lower or lumbar spine. And then there's 12 thoracic, um, which is like your rib cage. Mm -hmm. And then you have your neck on top. Um, so I don't know how the anatomy gurus like initially determine that uh, combination of like function and I think, you know, studying the physical anatomy of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we've got, so I think that's just interesting. So we've got part of our spine is supposed to be stationary. Part of our spine is supposed to be able to rotate. And if those things get confused, then of course that's going to cause all kinds of problems. So I think it's interesting, you know, one of the, um, one of the things you had us do was like squeeze the foam roller between our knees and someone mentioned like, oh, that makes this exercise much different because um, now it doesn't feel like it's, it just feels like it's doing different things. And that, that kind of like bending of the knees and sort of locking the lower spine in place is a, is a bit of a, I wouldn't say common, but it's like something that's used often to like purposefully make the lower spine stay still while we do um, other stuff. So, so yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. I think that's a it's a great technique and you can apply it throughout like different exercises if there's a if someone posted like a half kneeling um, trunk mobility it has the same concept right you're using the hip to sort of block the lower part of the body um, and and thinking about when we're doing mobility work being really specific and and um, thoughtful about where are you trying to gain mobility and why and are you actually working on the part of the body you want to be working on if you do sort of like a looser spinal twist um, you might find a lot of that motion comes from the we call the thoracic lumbar junction so the spot where the middle spine and the lower spine meet mm -hmm. likes to do a bunch of weird stuff uh, so you might be like, oh, I'm moving all in this one spot, and that's actually not at all the spot that I was trying to move, because um, like we talked about earlier, your, your body is task-oriented, so if you say, I want to rotate as far as possible, um, your body will find a way to rotate as far as possible. It may not be from the part that you were actually trying to move. Excellent. Well, I think there's also like these details um, also inform for, uh, for players, like why it's so important to occasionally, like, you can look up a lot of stuff on the internet and you can like figure out some of the stuff on your own and, and ultimate players are smart and so therefore they think they're smart at everything um, because, <laughs> because they're a software engineer they're going to figure out how they should do x y and z okay so some of that's true but there's but there is something to going to an expert occasionally who can look at what you're actually doing who can tell you the details because some of these details um you know i think there's also a difference between reading something on a blog versus being with someone who can um just has instant recall of like what the important things are like right this minute while um while you're in front of them so um so yeah i mean i think it's great that the ultimate players are trying to educate themselves about a lot of these things about how to do strength and conditioning about how to do mobility and tissue work and all that stuff um but there is a time and a place to go <laughs> to go and see a, a person and i think like you know if you're if you're having issues with some of these tests here's here's a just my general advice would be to try some of these sort of corrective exercises um and then and then we talked about like how long should we wait to see an effect and you said it depends which it does but i think like if we if you're trying to work on something i'd say a good kind of time frame is maybe like three weeks if you're working on something consistently for like two to three weeks like 
almost every day doing some of these exercises. And if you see like no difference, then that could mean, well, okay, you've misdiagnosed what's going on. Maybe you didn't actually do the, maybe you're not actually doing the test correctly. You're missing the details. Maybe you're not doing the um, corrective exercises the way you think they are. There might be some detail missing, or maybe there's just like something else going on. So, um, so for those of you who are on this call thinking about how to apply it to your own body, um, that would be sort of my general advice, especially if you've got a specific issue that you're um, trying to work on for yourself. Do you have anything you want to say about that to agree or disagree? No, I think three weeks is a great timeline. And I think if it's something that's painful, I would say even less. Because mm -hmm. um, it's a lot harder to manage pain on your own without the, the advice of someone that's educated on that particular subject. Um, a lot of my uh, frisbee playing patient clientele are uh, educated, smart in individuals. A lot of them have read or tried a lot of things already. Um, and they always are like, wow, like how do you know all this stuff? Like I tried <laughs> to figure this out and I couldn't figure it out. Like, how do you know? And I think it's important to like recognize I have a doctorate degree. I did nine semesters of doctorate level training and then I went back to school and did a year-long specialty oh Anna we just lost your your sound I think that's I think that's not just me <laughs> did you sit on your mute button like I sometimes do <laughs> Uh, I don't think you're muted. Oh, wait. I don't think so. I think it might be your headset. Is it battery operated? For a few of you who just joined us, we are having a slight technical difficulty. Oh wait, did you just mute yourself? Um, <laughs> so we were just talking about um, if you're going to apply some of these things that we were talking about with our um, mobility stuff, kind of a good time frame is three weeks of corrective exercises. If you're having issues still, um, or if you're having pain with any of the stuff we're talking about, it's a good time to see an actual human being. Um, and then <laughs> Anna was just telling us her, uh, about um, her educational background and how Ultimate Players are surprised that she knows so much. Um, I would say I have some analogous um, interactions with players with regards to strength and fitness. There's a lot that we can learn on online. It's great to educate ourselves, but at some point, uh, yes, people who study the thing for years, um, will know more than you. And I think this is kind of an interesting time to talk about this in this age of pandemic. We're kind of seeing the effects of everyone trying to figure out stuff by looking at blogs versus, <laughs> versus listening to the experts. And we also see um, that the experts are the ones who are at least like to, likely to uh, sometimes say that they know for sure um, what's going on because it's always more complex. Uh, okay, Anna, can you say something? Have you sorted yourself out? I'm trying the computer mic. Can you okay, great. Yes, me? we can hear you. Great. So we awesome. are, <laughs> you were just talking about how awesome and educated you were and then your mic cut out. I don't know. <laughs> that. <That's fine>. These <laughs> are not my headphones. Um, so I don't know why the mic's not working, but I do know how to switch the input. <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> You're not being an expert. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So um, yeah. Okay. So I just summarized a bit of what we were talking about. Um, yeah, so where were we? We were talking um, about, well, we started talking oh. about thoracic spine mobility, and then, yeah, that's an issue a lot of us have. So um, so we talked about, um, in the Facebook group, you can see <clears throat> um, at least two correctives for that. Oh, one of the correctives is um, the self-mobilization with the foam roller. So I had someone ask me last week, 
um, about that one because, so we're talking about the thoracic spine's inability to rotate, but that particular corrective is not in a rotational direction. So what's up That's with a that? That's question. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let me try to make this like understandable. Um, there is definitely a rotational way to do a mobilization with the foam roller. It just is kind of complicated uh, and maybe not something that I would like to jump to doing at home. Um, but the same sliding motion of the joint that we were talking about earlier, um, when if this is my right side joint and I'm turning to the right, the joint slides down and back, which is the same motion the joint does when you arch your back. So they're actually working um, the same kind of motion in the joint. Um, with the rotation, you're doing one side at a time, and with mm. the arching, you're doing both sides at the same time. Oh, so you're talking about kind of like the little wings, like whether you're doing one at a time yeah. or both. Okay. Yes, gotcha. yep. When we're thinking about the, the little bird probably has little wings. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, great. Wow, I definitely... And something new. Uh, okay, cool. So thoracic spine was an issue for a lot of us. We've got some great correctives to try. Um, and then if that doesn't work, we'll uh, try something else. Um, and I think that's, that's also interesting you brought up. There's some things that you could do that like not everything that you would do, you would recommend at home because it's like either a little more awkward or maybe you probably also have better or more specialized equipment for some of these, these issues. Yeah, and a lot of it is just, um, like getting the right cueing and teaching and the complexity of the movement. And, um, you know, I don't want to have people like go home and do things wrong and feel worse. Mm -hmm. um, so generally the things that I think we should be doing on our own are a little bit simpler. Um, not necessarily less effective, just different. Right. Great. Um, okay, let's uh, move on to the last uh, couple. So we had a half kneeling ankle mobility. Now it seems like in that post that you had some personal experience with that particular um, one. Did you have an oh, yeah. ankle injury <laughs> that you, you want to talk about? <laughs> sure. Um, I've had a, a couple different injuries to that ankle. Um, there's a really beautiful picture. I will try to, to dig it out um, of the Facebook archives for you all if I can of me. I think it's like my freshman year of college ultimate uh, with my ankle wrapped like mid sprain. So oh, I'm like no. spraining through a wrap, um, which is uh, actually like side tangent. If your ankle is bad enough that it needs to be wrapped, you shouldn't play. Uh, <laughs> just FYI. Um, so had some history of instability on that side. And then a few years back, I actually, um, had a high ankle sprain, which is a more serious, um, it's actually a very different kind of injury than we typically think of an ankle sprain. Um, in a high ankle sprain, there's a little cringe factor here. So, um, the two bones in your le lower leg, the, the tibia and the fibula, they actually split apart and it tears the membrane that holds them together. And it is incredibly painful. Um, so this is the injury that like, if you have someone you're playing fantasy football and you have them on your roster and they get a high ankle sprain, they're on injury reserve. You should just like, just get rid of them. Just trade them. <laughs> good tips, good tips. <laughs> Important tips. Um, yeah, so that was a, uh, is a, it was a rough injury. I uh, definitely had that, like, I, I think if you've been injured, you've had that moment of, oh, I, I might never play ultimate again. Uh, what is this going to be like? I had a, a co-worker um, do my rehab. He was fantastic. Uh, and I was also very lucky that um, one of the, at the company I was working with, one of the clinics has this very fancy piece of equipment, which is an alter g anti-gravity treadmill uh so i Sounds got to cool. start yeah they're really cool but they're like stupid expensive uh so i got to start running very early in the rehab process because i could run at partial weight bearing um i think it goes as low as 40 percent wow. uh that that all being said i like worked really hard 10 weeks of pt we wanted to go out for like you know high level club was not ready didn't even go to tryouts um ended up not really, it took about a year. I mean, re realistically about a year for me to, to play uh, comfortably. Um, 
in anyway, this all leading up to, um, I had a really bad restriction in that uh, ankle bending motion. Um, part of that is because of that particular type of injury. You're just not allowed to do that for a long time um, mm -hmm. because when you bend the ankle, it splits those bones again, so it re-injures it. So I developed this restriction uh, in response to the injury. Um, and after the injury finally healed, um, which I had to stop playing on it for a while, <laughs> um, then I also had to spend a, a significant amount of time really like getting that motion back um, because it was pretty limited. So I'm very happy that it's pretty good now. Um, and this is kind of where we talk about that like functional motion versus symmetrical motion. Uh, it's probably not symmetrical, but it is definitely functional. It does not bother me when I play. Uh, it doesn't bother me when I squat. Uh, it doesn't bother me when I do anything that I want to do, go down the stairs, all those things. So you might see that as your kind of going through your own injury recovery processes, sometimes the body is never the same, but that doesn't mean it can't be perfectly fine and mm -hmm. non-painful and fully functional. So that's a long story about my ankle. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's good. But I think that's also informative as um, I know some athletes do um, turn into perfectionists sometimes um, when it comes to some of this stuff. So if you're not perfectly symmetrical, um, again, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong deeply wrong with you um, but you know it's just maybe a, a hint that maybe there's stuff to work on or a hint that well you know you, you might um, you don't have to be perfectly symmetrical in order to be as you say functional yeah. so most, most people's bodies are not symmetrical which right. is something I think yeah. we've been like sort of misled on with the right. myth uh, of, of popular science yeah yeah well I, and I think when you look at most sports most sports are asymmetrical in nature we all have dominant hands um, the, it's not like it's popular advice to try to become equally left and right handed in normal every day. Um, and, uh, so, uh, so yeah, I think some, some asymmetry is just going to happen. Um, but it's when it becomes, uh, um, uh, highly asymmetrical or when it causes us problems in some of these mobility screens, that's when we know, okay, maybe now we really need to pay a little bit more attention. So, um, okay, good. So the next one was the supine overhead reach. Um, so actually, I have a question on this one. For this one, I, I pass this test like very easily, but I, I do know that when I do wall slides, uh, standing up, uh, I feel like I have to fight really hard to keep my rib cage from uh, flaring out. <clears throat> so I'm just wondering if that if that's like a thing that you've seen before. Is that a common issue or not so much? Without seeing you do it, my guess initially would be that it's like a more of a motor control issue. Mm, okay. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to take a look at, um, this, uh, sort of overhead reach test in particular is very lats biased. Um, and when you are doing like the, the wall slide, you're getting some other, you're getting some rotation into it. Mm -hmm. Um, so if that's more restricted, that might be also be leading you to compensate, um, interesting. the ribs. Yeah, I think, you know, it may be, in fact, a motor control thing. I think some of that comes from just the constant cueing of early in my lifting days of just really pulling everything through and then pulling things behind, pulling my elbows behind my rib cage, which sort of pulls everything in a, uh, getting sort of motion where there maybe shouldn't be. So sort of like, um, yeah. Uh, so for those who um, don't know, just the rib cage flaring would be if you if you pull your elbows far back beyond your um, beyond your uh, chest, you often will have this this um, lifting up of the sternum. So that's not actually what you want. So that's something to think about as you're doing dumbbell rows or any rowing motion. Um, it's pretty common, I think, to see this in um, folks who lift weights. Um, so I would not be surprised if I have some of that slightly not yeah. functional movement. I think we see that in um, the old school squat patterns also mm. that are very like, they're like really, really forward in attempt to keep the back straight, but the back is like hyper um, extended in that position. Mm. Um, so if you were, have been lifting for a long time and you were really trained to really mm. lift the chest in those ways, it might just be like a pattern that's sort of ingrained. 
yeah, that would that would also definitely fit with my history too. So huh, interesting. Yeah. So sometimes these mobility things don't even have to do with fully just mobility, but also what our brains are telling our bodies to how to move if we have reps of a certain certain kind of way. I think you actually got to that got at that in um, one of your Facebook comments about maybe doing having to do like two to three thousand reps to sort of fix to sort of uh, retrain your brain and body how to <laughs> how to do yeah. this thing. So this was a, a very cool. Um, as part of my like professional conference, they did a panel debate between like the ortho sports people and the neuro people about the best ways to train uh, different movement patterns. It was an awesome presentation. Um, but I like just remember that particular comment because I was like, oh, that's so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. But someone did the math in the group and, I, and they were like, oh, well, that's like something I could accomplish in a year. And I think that's right. a really good perspective. It sounds overwhelming, but these things take time. And if you have been playing for a year, you've been playing for, for 10, 15 more years, you know how long that skill development takes. It's not actually that surprising. Like it, it might take mm, yeah. a year or two to really master a new movement. Yeah, that's true. We, we don't expect people to really be able to master a forehand and in a, a few months. I mean, you can get decent at it, but you're not really going to be great at it until, <laughs> until at least a year, I think. So yeah, why would it be different for anything else? Good point. Um, okay, last last thing was the uh, prone hip flexion. Uh, no, prone hip extension. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, do you have anything to say about how that um, relates to ultimate performance? So that's uh, hip extension, we're looking at um, basically the ability of the body to like push off the ground, um, which happens in running and jumping, which uh, we like as ultimate players. Um, and power generation basically means like speed, jump height, quickness kind of stuff. Um, that's what it translates into. So hip extension is one like factor of many factors that goes into those kind of high level tasks. Um, but it is one that is kind of important and easy to screen. Um, like trying to teach someone to screen their own knee extension is a lot more complicated. So the hip you can kind of see for yourself. Um, the, I would say generally speaking, most of the ultimate players I see have pretty good hip extension, probably be because we're using it all the time mm -hmm. um, in the ways that we move. If they're limited, um, there's usually some kind of issue going on that might need like some kind of clinical treatment. Um, this is a lot more common in like older folks, mm -hmm. uh, though we do have some aging athletes now in Ultimate, um, which is really cool. We have people have been playing for a very long time. They might start to struggle more with their hip extension. Um, and we'll also see it like just with that inactivity. So not your people that are playing and training all the time, but your weekend warriors or people that only come out for summer league. Um, those kinds of athletes might have more difficulty with something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so for those of you who need a reminder on um, what all tests we're talking about, or if you're not part of the Facebook group, I just posted a link to um, a blog post that has all the screens in them as well, if you wanna do a quick check. Um, and then, um, yeah, I want to open it up here to uh, questions. So um, the way we do this is if you have a question, you can, um, you can just unmute yourself and ask. I'll like give a moment of silence here in a minute. You can also um, type it in the chat box. Um, that's also a good way to sort of like wait in line. I'll ask you if you want to ask it um, verbally uh, since we're recording. Um, if you want to, um, you know, show us your face on video. That's also um, just kind of cool and helpful. Um, all those controls to unmute and show your video are in the lower left. Um, so yeah, and any question you have um, will help everybody learn. So um, if you're shy and don't wanna be on camera and don't wanna um, ask it, you can just say so and I'll just read it in the chat box as well. So don't let that stop you. Um, we're here to uh, help and we hope you feel comfortable asking questions. So who has a question? I do have one. Um, so actually, I just want to know your opinion, because what I see from physical therapists and some doctors is that once they see a problem, they want to immediately solve it. And I'll give you a little bit of context here. I have a friend, an ultimate player friend. He has a rotation in his, uh, on his hip, and he has been practicing playing and 
lifting weights his whole life on it. And he started to have some pain in his lower back. Once he went to one of the physical therapists, the person tried to solve the problem, but it actually became worse. And what a second, when he had a second opinion, the person said, look, if I solve this problem, if I try to uh, put your hip back into place, you're going to, I'm taking away 30 years of your life or 35 years of your life doing that. And I'm actually going to try to find a way of just making your body function in a good way without pain. And uh, I mean, just to check your opinion, would you agree with that uh, with athletes? Because sometimes we have some kind of injuries, but if we don't feel pain. Can we just find a way of, of getting pain away from your body and being able to, to play without hurting or re-hurting yourself? Or do we have to solve the problem and then go back to playing? Because athletes are kind of crazy, I know, with pain. Definitely. This is a great question. I think um, you have actually touched on a, a larger debate that is going on within the medical and physical therapy and physio community right now. Um, so I can give you my opinion, but that is not necessarily a pervasive, like, yes, this is the right answer. Um, there is a lot of really interesting debates happening as, as we're, we're a relatively young field um, compared to other like branches of medicine. Um, so we are still learning. Uh, the, the hip rotation in particular um, became like very popular as a treatment a style uh, for a long time. And it's something that I might occasionally do, but it's not my go-to for the reasons that you said. If the athlete was functional before, if is it necessary? There, there's a lot of questions there. There's also some debates within the field about whether or not we can accurately palpate and diagnose that kind of issue. Um, so the sort of like newer theories of PT are more along the second opinion of um, focusing on pain reduction, functionality, uh, and working with our bodies in the ways that they, they are. Um, so uh, this is sort of related to this debate that we'll see about um, like if the position of the bones matters versus the way the joints are working. So I am uh, someone that lands more on wanting the joints to work correctly and less about are they sitting in the right spot? For those kind of reasons I said earlier, it's fairly difficult to, to palpate. It's difficult to back up with research. Um, so um, I would be more interested in if, if uh, someone like that, if everything was moving appropriate amounts, than um, if it was like just sitting in the right spot. Uh, is that helpful? I know that's like kind of a, a lot. Uh, yes, uh, it's actually, it would be like a follow-up question because I also hear people saying that there, there is a, the perfect position or the perfect posture. But like you said earlier in your talk, in your sayings is each person has a different body. And I think that that's why maybe physical therapists, doctors are actually going into this debate. We can't say that there is one perfect posture because the person might have a rotated hip, I had surgery in my shoulder, you had a problem in your ankle, and if we all try to put people on the same perfect position, you're going to have more trouble than, than not. Yeah. yeah, it was helpful, yes. Good, good. I think that's a great perspective. I think that's a, um, something that we have to consider, especially as athletes. We, a lot of us are perfectionists, so if we're told our body should be a certain way, we like really, really want it to be a certain way. <laughs> Um, and that's why I think of these mobility screens as sort of like thresholds. It's not like, oh, if I just like maximize my ankle mobility, maximize my thoracic mobility, I'll be a better athlete. It's just, I need this level of movement to function um, appropriately, comfortably, performance wise. Um, and, and the posture is really interesting. There are definitely some 
postures that can be disadvantageous from a, a, a injury performance standpoint, but there's like a wider range of normal. Normal's not a tiny box. Normal is a range of things. Um, and when I think of posture, I actually think of the ability to get in and out of multiple postures throughout your day, right? Like no one's gonna sit upright perfectly the whole day with their book on their head. Like we just don't sit like this all the time. <laughs> right, it wouldn't be good if we did. <laughs> it would hurt. <laughs> well, yeah, and as, as you mentioned, I mean, our bodies thrive on movement. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think this, this thriving, the striving for perfection can be can be damaging because if you do try to sit with perfect seating posture all day like all day or even stand with perfect posture that's not going to be as good for you as being in some imperfect postures having your weight on one more one foot more than the other sometimes jutting out your hip like moving around whatever so um so yeah i think that's important it also jives a lot with just like motor skills research about like gates walking standing there's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> and I, th I think there's a, a lot of like interconnected like topics here. Like number one, I mean, you mentioned the newness of uh, sort of all these fields of understanding the physical body. It's very complex. Um, so our knowledge is still developing. Um, and so, and you can, you can see the evolution of thought like there. And, and I think you can see this in other fields too, like this, this going away from this idea of like, okay, here's like the normal thing. And then everything that's deviated from that is like, just farther deviations from normal. And I think like you see this in so many fields like <laughs> psychology, um, like the range of like normal normal versus abnormal psychology. Well, okay, like abnormal is not necessarily deficient or defunct. Um, and I think the same is true for posture. And I think as, so where all this applies to ultimate coaches um, in the future, we're talking about right now, like strength and conditioning and mobility and stuff like that. But I think it also applies to how we think about our athletes um, as we are, as a sport super super new and we we have not yet settled on like the right way to teach a lot of throwing mechanics and maybe that's okay and in fact perhaps we have an opportunity to sort of realize a little bit from folks who have made mistakes before that maybe there's not one perfect uh forehand form or perfect pulling form maybe we can think about other ways to help our athletes that's just uh, maybe a slight shift from thinking about this model of like the perfect form versus just trying to get everyone to do that perfect form i but i think there's like room for like recognizing good form and that there's some form that's like probably not good but i think we also have to be a little bit like humble about what do we actually know um and and also just recognizing how young we are as a sport and how much more experience and study we need bit of a divergent there, but trying all the topics together. Uh, okay, who else has a question? Hey, me. <laughs> so um, I've been seeing a lot on the internet, many people from physical education area, they talk about a lot about mobility exercises. And I'm really trying to understand that because uh, we, at least, it will, is not a part of, a, of our curriculum in college, but I know it's a part of physical therapy. And I know many people, they, uh, they study many courses to know about this subject. So I was thinking, um, I don't know if I didn't uh, have enough kinesiology or something at college to know that, but what kind of exercises could be to could be considered to teach mobility in general because I've seen many types of exercises and um, I always pay a lot of attention to them and I know okay this is this movement in, it works on this joint etc I know this but uh, I don't know how they were created or something or if they're specific <laughs> And uh, if it's there's a specific group of exercises if it's just created for this, of if people are creating these exercises because they know the movements the body can do and et cetera. I don't know if it's clear enough. Are you talking it's about like for a physical education environment or like um, frisbee environment or, or both, neither? In general, because I've seen many people doing that, 
and they're not uh they're person they are um uh, oh my god i forgot the word <laughs> like a personal trainer they, they are just coaches mm -hmm. yeah they are personal trainer trainers and they teach any kind of I don't see Camilla anymore. I think we might have lost her. Oh, um, go ahead, Victor. Might help you a little bit with with context because here in Brazil we have two different uh, colleges to go through. If you want to be a physical educator, you're going to go through physical education course. We're going to have anatomy and a lot of other things, but not necessarily as in depth as physical therapists do. And I think it's actually different from the U.S. as well because. People go, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, people go through kinesiology and other stuff and not necessarily uh, physical pedagogy and all those kind of things. And it's not the same way as we have right here. Mm -hmm. So I think, and she might correct me if I'm wrong, that what she's asking is she sees a lot of physical educators here using mobility exercises, but she, not, she didn't see that in her college uh, degree. And is there, can we actually say that there are mobility exercises and strength and conditioning exercises, or is there a difference or are they, can they be considered the same? Um, I think there can be a difference, um, but it depends on what your goals are. So I always drive back to kind of like, why am I doing this? What is the point? Um, if we're working with a, a general population, like more, like you might be in a phys ed setting and, and everyone has very different skill levels, um, there's probably some benefit from like general mobility work. Uh, in that case, I like um, like a multi body part stretch, like the greatest stretch, you're like in a lunge with your trunk twisted. Um, because you're getting a lot of things at once. Um, so we can think of our mobility work as being specific exercises, but doing weightlifting can help your mobility. Um, so if you are squatting and you're lunging, you're doing these things, um, you're going through a lot of different motions and strength itself can actually help mobility. Um, so there is an overlap, right, between the, the two concepts. And I think if I understood correctly, uh, Camilla's other question was like, are there specific exercises that are taught or do we make them up? Um, and the answer is definitely both. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I definitely make up some of the exercises for my patients. If they're having trouble with something really specific and I just like want them to move in a certain way, I might create uh, an exercise based off of my anatomy knowledge and, and um, kind of tailor it uh, to them. And I do that a lot actually with the ultimate players that I teach because ultimate is not a sport that is like taught in traditional curriculum. <laughs> Uh, of movement, right? So um, we're taught a lot about uh, in PTs in PT school in the states, um, upper body throwing mechanics for baseball. That's like a big thing. Pretty different than upper body throwing mechanics for ultimate, though there are some things that are similar. Um, so modifying the things that we're taught to um, be specific to the athletes. So the more um, the more like the person I'm working with has specific sport goals, the more I want to tailor their um, their exercises to their specific sport. Camilla, do you have do you have any follow up? No, yeah, I I actually I I think I got everything that you said, and I also realized that working on mobility, one thing that you could do is trying for new different things like. Capoeira, calisthenics, gymnastics, yoga. There are some kind of exercises that they work for the whole body. And if you try it for something different, maybe it can help you 
in many ways that you don't even know. And yeah, that's basically that. I think that's good. I think the body craves variety. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so Neil, you have a question. Do you want to uh, unmute and ask or do you want me to um, read it for you? All right, I'll uh, go ahead. Yeah, so Neil says, I have poor flexibility and mobility um, and I have various knee pain issues. What mobility exercises or areas would be the best focus to alleviate pain um, in that area? Oh, right knee specifically. Uh, and then additionally, I struggle with the SLDL a lot, I think due to the tight hamstrings. Are there ways I can build up to that exercise or is there uh, any replacement for it? Um, okay, I'm going to start with the single leg deadlift question first because that has a much shorter and more simple answer. Um, so the single leg deadlift or drinking birds exercise asks a lot out of your body because you have to balance, you have to have enough strength, you have to have enough mobility. So if you find that you're... Um, having trouble with that exercise, I would break down those different components. So work on your single leg balance, work on your hamstring strength, like bridges uh, is probably a favorite of mine. Um, and then uh, work on your hamstring length by stretching and doing those things separately because it's a lot easier than combining them all so like I love that exercise because it combines all those things, but that might not always be the best choice if it's something you're struggling with. Um, uh, you could, could try also doing a, like a two leg RDL. I find some people have trouble with that because of the neural tension in the um, back. So if it, if it doesn't bother you, you could start with that. Um, it takes out the balance component. Uh, but there are some additional challenges to that. Um, and so when we're looking at this, this your first question um, with right knee issues, uh, it's a little, it's a little hard. And I, I'm going to say like normally if someone came in to my clinic and asked me this question, I would do an hour long exam on you. So, <laughs> Um, it's hard to say, and, and this is a, a question that I run into all the time when I coach, um, the, the, uh, women that I coach, uh, frequently ask me, uh, my, this hurts, how do I stretch it? Um, it's not always the answer. So I'm a, a little hesitant to tell you, oh, like this stretch is going to fix your knee pain. Um, because there's a lot of things that can cause knee pain and uh, maybe 25% of them could be improved through mobility work, <laughs> uh, maybe 50, I don't know. Um, so looking at how you move overall as an athlete and how um, your knee is getting loaded in a way that is aggravating. Um, if you know that you have mobility restrictions, it sounds like you're generally not a very mobile person. That happens. So, like some people are just genetically like not stretchy. I'm very stretchy. Um, uh, we're all a little different. You might try to tackle some of those like things that you already know are, are challenges. Um, your hamstrings, looking at your ankles, um, and see if you see any improvement. Uh, with the knee doing that and that way you know if you end up eventually wanting to like see a professional you can say hey I've already tried these things and that's just more information for us um, to to kind of put into the bigger picture um, so yeah for the knee for the knee pain specifically I would say probably like evaluate yourself look at the screens try doing some of the things and see if you see any improvement and if not probably just seeking like more specific um, help okay great yeah when in doubt see someone is always a good good option uh, okay Neil says thanks 
and his baby is hopefully still sleeping. <laughs> okay, do we have other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask. If there's no more questions, that's fine. <laughs> if anyone wants to type in the chat box, you can do that too. Uh, maybe actually, I, just, I do want to wrap up here, um, but maybe just as a, a practitioner, you can give us athletes some advice about how to approach seeing a physical therapist. I know for me personally, the the journey of even finding a physical therapist and then, <laughs> I mean, it's the same with everyone. Trusting them to do their job <laughs> yeah. is uh, not always yeah. so simple. Why is it so hard to, um, why, why, is, why do you think that that is such a struggle? <laughs> You're laughing, it so is, it sounds like you yeah. understand. No, I know, I know what you mean. It is a struggle. Um, there are, unfortunately, like a lot of barriers in the process, um, which, we probably don't have time to go into like all of my feelings about how the medical system is set up. <laughs> uh, we haven't but... even talked about that. I mean, I mean, this is why all the Americans are on here is because we can't go it's so expensive. <laughs> we have no yeah. healthcare coverage, so forget it. <laughs> We're just going to yeah. suffer in pain, and that's why we look up so much stuff on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you so, if you are fortunate that you have coverage, um, it's easier. If not, I think you like. I'm happy to see someone. Um, uh, a lot of times, like uh, us as individual therapists, we don't get to see you pro bono or we can't change the costs because we're like not allowed to um, legally. But if you came in and you said, you know what, I can afford four sessions with you. I want four sessions. What should we do with them? Then I know what I'm working with and we can budget. Oh, that's genius. I would have never thought yeah. to <laughs> say that, like just yeah. to state your boundaries. <laughs> Um, because there are, for a lot of reasons, <clears throat> there are pressures on some therapists to see patients for many visits. Um, and I would say most of the time, ideally, I want to see someone for an average of like 15. Like that's 12 to 18. If they're post-op, it's going to be more, but for like a regular injury. But that doesn't mean you can't get a lot out of doing less. Um, and if you're in, like a lot of ultimate players are independent, they're hard working, they're motivated, they're actually going to do the things at home that you ask them to do at home. So if, if uh, money is the constraint, definitely consider that just like being really upfront with what your um, boundaries are. And depending on where you live, what kind of therapist you're seeing, you, they might be like me, like, okay, great. Or they might be like, oh, what are we going to do about this? And, and you might have to be more firm about um, setting your own boundaries. Uh, so that's, that's an option. Um, the other thing that has been, uh, I think, challenging for a long time is that um, the uh, physician, at least in the U.S., and I'd love to hear how it is in other places, um, in the U.S., the physician asks, acts as kind of a gatekeeper to treatment. Um, so uh, for a long time, you had to get a physician's prescription to have physical therapy. Um, that is, there are reasons for it. Um, there are things physicians screen that I don't screen, but there are also, if you look at the, like if you look at your primary care internal med physician, they've had one semester of ortho um, compared to I've had 12. Um, <laughs> uh, I have had physicians send me like a broken ankle for rehab and I'm like, no, please, you gotta go, you gotta go get an x-ray, <laughs> go get a boot, I don't want you. Um, so not to knock all physicians, but th there's some room to grow there. Um, so anyway, in, in a lot of the states in the US, um, direct access to PT is becoming more common. Um, unfortunately, the, the laws vary like grossly by state, so um, depending on where you are um, in Michigan, I can see someone for three weeks without a prescription. Um, so it's a lot easier because someone can just walk in and have treatment. Um, and the caveat being that some insurances don't cover that still because insurance is behind. 
Okay, so we've got a couple of barriers, right? We've got money. We've got this like weird relationship with like, can I just go to the PT or do I have to go to my doctor? Or what do I do? And all that. And then the other um, other thing is just like figuring out uh, as an athlete and as an ultimate player, like how do you pick a good one? <laughs> I think is like a concern a lot of people have. How do I trust this person? I don't know them. Um, getting a referral from your teammates is always like a reasonable thing to ask. Um, asking about the certifications that the person has. Do they do sports medicine? Do they do orthopedics? I have a specialty certification that's called an OCS. Um, there's one called an SCS for sport that I was going to get and then I just didn't want to ever pay to take the test. Um, so that would be a good one to look out for. Um, asking, the, you know, who is your sports person in this clinic? And, and when you see the therapist, if they're not interested in what, like if they don't know what ultimate is and they don't care, then I think there's something lacking. Cause I think that the, the, at least in my philosophy, the treatment should be sport tailored. Um, so I want to know, like I treat all sorts of athletes. If I have someone come in that plays a sport, I don't know anything about like water polo. I ask them like a thousand questions because I want to know mechanically what loads are they under? What do they have to do to perform? And then how can I help them with that? So there's just like a lot of uh, things you might want to discuss. And I, I think a lot of therapists, like if I get a call that asks those kind of questions, I'm like jazzed. I'm like, oh, this, this person, like they want to know what I know. And like, you know, they want to build that relationship with you. So just don't be afraid to advocate for, um, what you, you know, what you need. I think it's really great advice. I, th I think that, um, I know one of the struggles, I, I mean, you told an editor before about just like, if you do these things at home and then you, you go to see someone, you can tell them what you've already done. I mean, I've certainly had the experience of going to someone and having already done a bunch of stuff and have them not care and have them not listen. And then, well, I didn't do it exactly the way they said, so I have to like start over again. And that's <laughs> was usually frustrating, but um, you know, so I can, and I mean, it's kind of interesting because I mean, I'm sort of bit on both sides of it as a, an SNC person. It's just like, I, I also sort of tell people the same thing in some ways, like, yes, I know you've done some strength training, but we're going to do it this way. And this is why you hired me. And so I've also like sort of said the same thing. So I never know if I'm just being <laughs> unreasonable or if, uh, you know, there's a reason that I need to do the details. But I think so much of it is, uh, is about, um, you know, is this person at least listening and, and trying to find the solution versus just following a totally preconceived notion of what the issue is, especially when you're dealing with something as individualized as physical therapy. And all of us, I mean, like, we're just people, right? So there's going to be a range and who you click with and who you don't click with. And you have to, just like if you, you want to like your coach, like you, you want to like your, I mean, there are people you might not like who would be great therapists, but they might be great therapists for you. <laughs> Also good advice. Uh, okay, we got another question here from Chris. Uh, Chris, do you want to unmute and ask yourself, or should I read it for you? Oh, never mind. Anna pretty much just answered it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Are you sure? Feel free to uh, ask for more detail. Yeah, I figured it out. The way she was going through some stuff, I decided I'm just going to call my doctor and I'll start from there. So. That's a good gotcha. idea. Yeah, and I, I guess just looking at your question, Chris, I would guess that like, since you're saying you have a lot of ongoing minor injuries, like I would like talk when you whenever you get to an actual like sports person to talk to, talk to them about your overall like training and recovery load. Because a lot of times that kind of like oh I keep tweaking stuff. It can be like a a training like a programming issue, or nutrition or sleep or all, all that kind of stuff. It's always something different. So, yeah, it makes you wonder, I, I, I right? Same, yeah, I don't have the same issue that's ongoing. It's one, you know, one day it's this, and next week it's something else. So it's like, you know, and I'm 48, so that's part of it. Um, A little bit, maybe, but, but I wasn't I think, permanently yeah. I wasn't permanently damaged from my ser from my army service, so that was good. But, um, it's just I don't know. It's probably just I'm getting too old for some of this shit. So. Yeah, and there's definitely a lot of like as our it's it's hard for I think for athletes as our bodies age we want to be able to like power through at the same level that we are used to always doing and I'm already feeling that um with 
like not that I can claim to feel what you're feeling, but it, it, things change as our body changes, and our, our training load has to change. Um, and so that yeah, that might like, like get you on a, a path where you can still get the the gains you want, the performance and strength gains, um, without aggravating all these like little things in your body. Yep, excellent. I think that's hard, and I think even though um, e even just like knowing that age is a factor still t takes a while to like the difference between knowing intellectually and like knowing physically what that means and then accepting that i think those are those are all different things and then it's complicated by the fact that well each individual is going to age a little differently and then also like each body is a little differently and the body is complicated so it is hard to like not get i think uh for me as an aging athlete it is difficult to not get in this like am i just being lazy am i just using an excuse like am i being smart I have no idea. Like, and <laughs> it would probably be uh, a couple of years of sort of, you know, learning to listen to your body is a, is a constant struggle. And the answers that your body gives you, I think, are ever changing, which is just one of the things that makes studying the body, um, you know, interesting and aggravating at times. Okay, so do we have um, other questions? I think I want to um, wrap up. I'd say if you have other questions, actually, um, feel free to join us in the Facebook group. So again, if you're not in the Facebook group, it's Social Distance Training Tips. Uh, you can look that up. Uh, and um, yeah, and so I just wanna thank you, Anna, for doing such an amazing job this week in both the UAP members group and in the social distance training tips group, just providing so much information. You gave us so much nuance and so many things to do, really actionable and also educational. I think that was just like, you know, it just, you just gave us all the stuff. Uh, so useful and so insightful. So thank you so much. Thanks, Melissa. It's nice to like be able. I talk to my teammates about this stuff all the time. They're sick of it, so it's really nice to talk to some other people um, about it. And uh, the group has been wonderful and super engaged. So it's just been uh, totally fun. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, not sure what our topic is going to be next week. Oh, I do know what our topic is going to be. We're going to talk about transitioning from uh, into like some of these. Uh, We've got as we've got restrictions sort of loosening around the world about um, people sort of getting out of various forms of lockdown. We're going to talk about um, social distance related things when it comes to trying to get back into playing a bit of frisbee stuff. Um, so I just want to say to frame next week, we don't want to say that we're like the expert experts. Everyone's going to follow their own regulations, but that's what's coming up. We want at least want to start a conversation so we can work on how we're going to think about all this complicated stuff. Um, so yeah, so that's what's on tap for next week. Um, again, if you enjoy uh, this, then please let your friends know uh, about the group um, because uh, coaches love to coach and the bigger the audience, uh, kind of the more fun it is. So, um, so yes, yeah, so please bring your friends along, um, help everybody learn, and we will all uh, get through this together. Thanks, y'all.